to you from Columbus, Ohio. Welcome to another episode of Just Calvin. Hello and welcome to another edition of Just Calvin. I am here with uh, Justin Peclino, who is running for... Uh, uh, a uh, forest selectman, is that right, in uh, New Haven? Is that New Haven or? Uh, Guilford, Guilford, Connecticut, which is uh, near New Haven. Okay. Uh, now, for those who don't know, and including myself, uh, what is the, uh, the position you're, you're running for and how many people are running for it? Uh, so Board of Selectmen is kind of the, you know, um, executive board uh, of of the town of Guilford, kind of, it's like a city council. Uh, instead of a mayor, we have a first selectman. And um, instead of a city council, we have a board of selectmen. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's analogous to that. Um, and this year there are um, four open seats and five candidates running, including myself, two Democrats, two Republicans, and myself as a Green. And the way the ballot is formatted for Board of Selectmen, a voter can pick two. Uh, so it sets up an interesting dynamic. Uh, this is something I think about a lot is, the, is ballot formats because, you know, um, I'm a proponent of ranked choice voting um, and uh, I'm a proponent of proportional representation, having more than one representative per district, uh, maybe, you know, two or three. Um, I, I'm also in favor of increasing the size of the house. So um, the US house. So, you know, th the way the ballots are formatted ha are tremendously important. And, um, you know, the, the way this ballot is formatted is a little odd um, that you can, there's four open seats, but you can only vote for two. Um, you know, I'd like to explore whether uh, multi-winner rank choice voting could be used on our town ballot. That's just one idea I'd like to explore if I were elected. Mm. Uh, so does that also mean that you, uh, if, you if elected, uh, you have the responsibility of, of uh, choosing the curriculum for a school district or? Choosing the what? The curriculum, like the topics that are, are, uh, are being taught. In schools? Yes. Well, that's really more of a board of education um, topic. Uh, we have had quite a year on, for, <laughs> in terms of controversy and our board of elect our board of education race. Uh, like many, you know, like many um, places in the country, there's been controversy over critical race theory uh, and you know equity and inclusion measures. Um, critical race theory is a graduate law school level concept, so it's not being taught in any schools, any primary schools, uh, but, uh, you know, there's been a lot of propaganda going around, I think, mainly from Fox News and, I don't know, other, other outlets that I, I don't really follow, but it's apparent that there's a coordinated effort um, on right-wing media uh, to really rile people up. And it's had a, quite an effect in Guilford to the point where they got five candidates to run for board of education and uh, who are all running on this anti-critical race theory uh, platform. And they won. They won at the, at, the, uh, at the Republican caucus. And then the Republican party held a primary and they won again. And they won handily. Like, I don't know, like five to one uh, in the, like three to one at the, at the caucus and like five to one at the primary. So the Republican voter base in Guilford really supports this. Um, and it's, it's concerning, it's scary because, you know, these folks are really angry over what is really a non, I mean, a not, a, not a real problem. Uh, at the most, you know, what the superintendent of our schools has been trying to do is to, um, is to make people feel welcome, no matter their background at the school. And that's all 
he's trying to do. You know, it's he, he's talk. He's encouraging teachers to uh, be aware of best practices for making students of minority groups, uh, not just race, but or you know, sexual orientation uh, or um, abled or disabled. Uh, you know, all kinds of things. Um, and that's all it is to me. It's really a benevolent thing, just trying to make people feel welcome. But they view it as this horrible agenda that's going to make their children feel. They what they say is they they believe their children are being taught that that because of the color of their skin they are bad, which is not true at all. They're being. That's the premise of this whole campaign is that <laughs> um, that children white children are being taught that they are oppressors. It's just not true. It's just simply not true. So um, anyway, we have uh, on our ballot for Board of Education, you can vote for the same number of seats that are open, which is different from my race. So we, the, we got three independents to run on top of our two incumbents. So now voters can go and vote for row A and row C, there's an under Board of Education, they can vote for five candidates who support the superintendent and there's five open seats. And most likely I think they're going to win because Republicans are a minority in our town about, you know, there's twice as many Democrats as Republicans. And um, I'm trying to find out how many Greens or, you know, Green supporting people are in town, partly by running for office. Um, but it's been quite quite a year, a lot of, of activity on Facebook groups. There's like three or four Guilford Facebook groups, a lot of arguing back and forth, um, a lot of attention being paid to the Board of Education race, a lot of signs around town, vote A plus C equals B O E or vote row B. Row B is the is the Republicans who are afraid of critical race theory. So, <clears throat> you know, it's an it's a bit of an and I didn't want to mess up that strategy. You know, if I ran for board of education, it might just confuse things because they also already had those three independents running, and but I still um, wanted to run for office because I'm really interested in trying to build up the Green Party. The Green Party needs to keep going strong. We need people to run for office. We have over 100 Greens across the country holding office. Mm. And we want to keep it above 100. And we want to grow that number. Um, and uh, so I'm doing you know, my part trying to run for office, but also as a means to build the party and looking for other people who... Um, might be interested in forming a, a town committee, a green town committee with a treasurer and a budget and uh, hopefully more people to run for office uh, the next time we have municipal elections. That sounds good. Uh, I've been uh, trying to get other Green Party members to uh, be more commutative uh, nationwide and try to get more of a kind of a almost centralized, but not, not that much more vetting of, you know, uh, people who think the same way in regards to the Green Party or people who don't know much about the environment and other things to learn more about it and see if they be willing to join the Green Party. I, I've become uh, kind of an official, but unofficial member of the Ohio Green Party. Um, and I understood and I understand that Columbus, where I'm at right now, uh, has, I think, 13 members uh, for, for, the, for that branch, which obviously is pathetic, but yeah, anyway, uh, hopefully we'll at some point uh, get more, but, well, uh, but Well, you know, it takes, um, you know, that's at least a, a small group of people. You know what Margaret Mead said about a small group of committed people is all it takes to make a difference. And it's a start, you know, it's, it's somewhere to go from. And there's probably, um, you know, if you pull the voter registration rolls, uh, from your town registrars in that area, you'll you'll find a lot of people registered as Greens who are not tied in to coming to meetings, who are not tied in, you know, to to the activism side of it. But 
that you'll find a lot of people who identify as greens more than more than just those 12. You might be pleasantly surprised. Um, no, I, no, I know. I, 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 I don't imagine it's because uh, since uh, the Green Party is a, a third party in a two party state uh, or country, really, um, that the, since it's so difficult to get the Green Party on the ballot, that people may want to vote Green, but because there yes, it's far more signatures and makes far more money than the two other uh, parties, uh, they just like, well, go with the two uh, with one of the two for now until we're able to get more momentum. So, but yeah, that, this that, is a this is a the issue I think about all the time <laughs> is how do we grow? Uh, how do we make our democracy more representative? Because um, you know, as Howie Hawkins likes to say, party suppression is a form of voter suppression. You've got a lot of people who want to vote their values and feel their values lie with a different party from the main two, but they're intimidated against voting for uh, uh, a third party if they feel that's gonna be a wasted vote, you know, both on the left and the right. Uh, so, <clears throat> um, you know, rank choice voting in combination with um, multi, multi-member districts is something that could um, really bring us uh, closer to um, a more representative democracy. I mean, it would make a huge difference. The t- you know, two out of three people when polled are, say that they, they're tired of the two-party system. They don't believe it's working. They don't believe it's doing a good job representing, um, uh, representing the people. And it doesn't. I mean, it's absurd to think that two sizes fits all, right? It's absurd mm-hmm. to say that, you know, everybody is going to, fit into one of two boxes. Uh, People have diverse ranges of opinion and they look at other countries, look at European countries where they have parliaments on proportional representation. They, uh, you know, they have multiple parties that flourish and we we can do that. We can do that in America and we should be doing that because, um, you know, with a few simple reforms, we can do that. And we should be doing it because the two-party system is, it's not that it's just not working. It's also toxic. Uh, It's just turning people away from politics. It makes our politics divisive, polarizing. Um, You know, it's, it's, uh, (laughs) it's, it leads a lot of people to drop out. I hear people arguing, oh, voting doesn't matter. I shouldn't vote because, uh, it's not going to make a difference. Corporations have bought the system. And, you know, in, in some ways, that's true. Corporations have corrupted both the major parties and have a lot of control. But I still believe the only way to get back that power back is by voting and and activism. I mean, so, you know, I believe strongly that by just even just by appearing on the ballot, even just by having a Green Party line, or if you're a libertarian, a libertarian line, just by having candidates appear on the ballot, you can get people to start thinking more about expanding this democracy, diversifying this democracy, getting, um, making it easier for people to really just go in there and to the ballot and box and vote their values. Just vote, vote for what you want. And with ranked choice voting, you don't have to be afraid that you're throwing away your vote. Yeah. Um, and it, ranked choice voting is gaining a lot of appreciation. More and people are talking about it. I also see people online who tell me um, there's systems that are even better than ranked choice voting, like star voting or maybe approval voting. That gets into a very technical argument. Um, <clears throat> and, yeah, well, I'm, I mean, if, if, you, if you look at the, uh, the fact that we barely get you know, ranked choice voting involved in the electoral system period. I think it's going to be a far reach to get those other types that even though there are some fa- uh, factors of the, of the country that want the other type, uh, this would be a, a starting point. If, this, if the country were able to get used to the idea of being able to vote for more than one person and ranking them as, as the votes go. Like what, uh, what happened in New York in the, in the mayor's race, you know, uh, or in Maine in the uh, 
it's a congressional race or something. Uh, I forget who it was. It was a race Senate, race. Senate race with this, um, yeah, with uh, uh, uh oh. and it was this is a Collins, but I forgot the uh, Green Party uh, uh, oh. candidate's name. Oh, oh, it was I'm blanking on her name. Oh God. Um, anyway, I'll it, find it. it. Yeah, it, it's all good. Uh, before we started this, I asked you about the uh, uh, about the thing on your neck uh, uh, in the picture I saw on, uh, on GP.org. And you told me uh, about that in your in your medical uh, uh, background. And one of them is uh, was it research in uh, like a virology or some type of fact, or did, or or did I misheard you or I hear you? Um, I'm I'm sorry. Um... I'm stuck on remembering the person's name. Oh, here she is. Lisa Savage. Okay. Yeah, because I wanted to get her name out there because she's an, a role model to me. She's like Jill Stein. She's important. Uh, you know, like anybody who runs green, they're important. They, <clears throat> they raise the profile. And Lisa Savage, especially because she ran in a state with ranked choice voting. Mm -hmm. she, she really um, got people to think about what's possible and <clears throat> um, it's going to take time to, yeah. to kind of undo the two-party mindset and and but you you do that by building up third parties and fighting for ranked choice voting and um, <clears throat> I had a long I'm sorry I'll get to your question in a second but I had a long discussion yesterday on Twitter with someone about running third party. And is it harmful to run third party candidates if there's a chance you might tip an election towards a Republican? Because the Republicans are have become even more radical than they ever were, and they are um, anti-democratic, and you know they're they're off the rails, and <clears throat> you know. I'm not unsympathetic to that argument, um, but I said, you know, I think, uh, first of all, it really depends on the race, Espe you know, especially um, at lower levels. I don't think there's any argument that, you know, Democrats in the state legislature in Connecticut could afford to lose a few seats. Like they're not gonna, they're still gonna control power if that's what you're concerned about. Um, <clears throat> But, uh, you know, it, and but if they lose a few seats to a few greens, then they're going to say, hey, you know what? Well, they are not going to lose to the greens. They'll lose to the Republicans if the greens spoil them. And then they're going to say, hey, you know, maybe we need ranked choice voting, because if we had it, there'd be no spoiler effect. We can get those seats back for our party. So that I think you have to have a good cop, bad cop approach. She was talking about the good cop approach, like go to the Dems and just make a friendly case, say, we're your ally, we want to help uh, <clears throat> help you implement uh, voting reform that's a win-win, and you'll be, and, and that's kind of what Voter Choice Connecticut has been doing. That's a pro ranked choice voting group in Connecticut. You have them all over. Look for one in your state, folks. And, <clears throat> um, but that's like the good cop. And the, the Green Party to me is like, you also need the kind of the bad cop, which is to say, we're here, we're a political force, and we're, you know, something to be reckoned with. Yeah. And, and if you want, if you don't want us to be a spoiler problem, you have the power to end that. Don't look to us. All we're trying to do is provide um, representation for a large number of people that feel uh, they're not being represented by your party. And, you know, we we have we're free to run we're free to to take the votes that people want to give us if they want to give us if you want us to stop being spoilers that's within your power you have the power to do that so go ahead and do it so that's a good cop bad cop approach yeah. uh, <laughs> and you know i'm it's hard to persuade me uh even in important races that people shouldn't um vote their values because you know there's even if the Democrat is better in some ways than the Republican, and I think there are many cases where that's legitimately true, um, you know, uh, there's still, you're still kind of perpetuating a two-party system that's toxic. And where is that headed? You know, 
January 6th to me was a wake up call that um, Donald Trump was a wake up call that um, to me, those are signs of the two party system and its toxicity that it's people are feeling disenfranchised. So these Donald Trump voters, they rejected all the establishment Republicans. They've already rejected the Democratic Party, which with free trade policy has decimated the economy of rural America, all the manufacturing jobs are gone, not all, but you know, they've, they've been decimated. And <clears throat> um, I think there's a lot of economic pain out there in rural America that they feel neither party is addressing. And look, I think there is also uh, racism that's to account for Donald Trump and, you know, xenophobia, but it's not the whole picture. I think, you know, I, I made the point um, that you know, it's hard to get someone, uh, it's hard to scapegoat foreigners uh, for taking your job if people haven't lost their job. Like if people are employed and doing well, they're not looking for someone to blame for their problems because they're doing all right. You know, Donald Trump is taking advantage of people's suffering by giving them scapegoats and, you know, false scapegoats. Uh, but people just looking for someone to blame for their problems. If they were doing well, they wouldn't need scapegoats. So, uh, you know, the two-party system uh, where both parties really have abandoned uh, the working class because they're pro-business, they're pro-free trade, um, is, is to me what's really underpinning this whole anti-democratic, um, uh, authoritarian, uh, right-wing movement, people looking for scapegoats, people uh, looking to, um, to uh, you know, people who have lost faith in democracy and are doing things like storming the Capitol building to disrupt a democratic process and who don't believe that. So I really think um, you have to weigh that in. If you're worried about this, this important Democrat versus Republican race, just ask yourself, you know, just, you know, just because you get a Democrat in there and not the Republican doesn't mean everything's going to be hunky-dory. In a way, you're propping up a two-party system that is leading us to a bad place. So, sorry, I went off there, but... <laughs> no worries. Uh, and, yeah, um, I think that there's, there was a point in time while I was doing this and I was thanking Donald Trump for being so openly corrupted that he highlighted and made the corruption of the DNC just that more transparent. So I think that's another reason why there has been uh, kind of a movement uh, for a third party, but because so many, so many organizers that work through the DNC, like people who work uh, with the uh, Social Alternative and the DSA, both of whom uh, are now interconnected uh, and to a certain degree as far as memberships go, uh, are also connected with DNC. So they co-opted uh, uh, the, the more popular socialist movement and the democratic socialist movement, uh, leaving uh, people who actually want a third party kind of out in the cold uh, and may or may not be willing to try to go for the process of getting a third party on the ballot. That's probably another reason why a lot of people are uh, not really interested in the Green Party because they they see the commitment that it takes and they put so much effort into the DSA or SA just to be screwed over. Um, they may, they may try to be trying to lift their political wounds in that case. So. Uh, yeah, I think um, the, uh, you know, there's, there's something to be said for an inside outside approach, uh, you know, and people go back and forth on, you know, do we reform the Democrats or do we build a third party? And, you know, but my answer is ultimately reforming the Democrats alone is not going to be enough because it still leaves us with this two party system. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and so you can try that and you can do that and you can make some progress there. Um, but to say that trying to build th parties is futile is really not understanding how toxic the two party system is and how inadequate it is, how anti democratic it is. Yep. Um, and if, if you think we're just going to go on uh, with a two-party system and everything's going to be okay as long as we can get more progressive Democrats in, you're missing 
the bigger picture. Yeah. Uh, you're missing the, a lot uh, of, you know, the toxicity of the two party system will, will remain and will continue to corrode. And <clears throat> so, yeah, you know, it's good if you can get some progressives into the Democratic Party. And I, so that's, that's like, like, just like the good cop, bad cop approach I was talking about for uh, electoral reform, you know, for progressive reform, I, I, I'm okay with an inside outside approach. I think we need people inside fighting for a more progressive democratic party, but we also need people outside fighting for expanding our system for reforming our system. So it's not a two party system anymore. Yeah. And, and um, you know, and, and some people within the democratic party already support that, but without a, without a third party there to be the, the impetus or the reason for having ranked choice voting, the, you, it doesn't make sense to want to try and break out of the two-party system if there aren't any third parties. No, so that's true, yeah. But, <laughs> that, but, but that also means that people would have to get out, excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, but that also means that when they get out and get initiatives done as far as a thir uh, third party initiatives and ranked choice voting initiatives in those, in those states that don't have those. But that, that's what I mean, is some people, who, if, if that is required, in order for get, get those legitimately as part of the electoral system, there may be a majority of people that uh, may, be, may be convalescing from, from the past uh, election and the two uh, social party combining each other. And like, okay, well, we better step back a little bit to see what's going on. So that mm -hmm. could be the reason why the Green Party, in some cases, especially in Ohio, have lost or have not gained any new members. Yeah, but, yeah I think, you know, Donald Trump being as awful as he is has made the Democrats look even better. Um, but that's, that's a lowering of your standards. That's saying, that's, that's saying, like, vote blue no matter who. That's, that's really sad, right? I mean, that's saying I'll vote for anybody as long as they're not. Exactly, you know, yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's the reason why I'm, I'm saying that people should get out and actually like do what they can to get the, their, their specific parties on the ballot and as a third party. Yeah. That, that's, that's what I mean by that. And the same thing for just voting and everything else, open primaries. Open primaries would allow the third parties to have a space to be able to fight, right? Yeah. So you know, uh, there's a lot of well-meaning, uh, great people in DSA right now, and I wish we could um, attract some of them, more of them, to the Green Party, uh, because they do seem to be sucked into, you know, resigned to working within the two-party system. Yeah. And uh, you know, I just think that's unfortunate. But you know, we. We continue to make our case for why this is the better, uh, why this is um, not necessarily the better approach, but why it's a needed um, co-approach, like inside and outside. You got to do both. Right. And we need more people in the Green Party um, to really uh, to really build up better and um and thrive. You know, Ralph Nader really gave us a boost when he ran. There was a huge uptick in membership. Uh, there was a huge uptick in candidates running for local office. You know, it was right now it's over 100, but at a point it was well over 200, maybe even 300 office holders across the country um, in the wake of Ralph Nader's success. And, um, and, and that wave is, has been coming down now. Uh, so, you know, that's also the power of, of running someone at the presidential level. Um, you know, so that has to be, you know, that that's a, has to be considered as a positive in favor of doing that. Right. Well, let's, let's go back to the, uh, the question I, I, uh, I was, I was going to try to ask you as far yes. as your background. Um, now, now, what is your background? Uh, I come from a medical science background. I went to med school. I um, graduated in 2001. I did two years of clinical pathology um, residency, which is also called lab medicine. It's, it's um, this, the, the practice of um, managing 
laboratories that do clinical testing. Mm. It's hematology, it's chemistry, it's immunology, it's microbiology, which was my favorite, and it's blood banking. But after two years of that, I really always, I, I decided I, I had an opportunity to really indulge my interest in research. Basic mm. medical research mm. is what always really attracted me. Um, <clears throat> and I found the opportunity, Yale had a, what they call an investigative medicine program that grants a PhD uh, for, for, for residents um, who are interested. So I applied, I got in, I, and I took some classes and I did a, a graduate work and I, I wrote a thesis, defended a thesis, started publishing papers and I got a PhD in uh, 2008. And then I went from there and I was enjoying research. So I said, I'm gonna stay with research. And I did um, 10 more years of research as a postdoc, uh, studying viruses that infect tumors. Um, and I started using um, animal models too in my, in my um, postdoc. And, you know, the, the, I won a grant. I won a five-year grant from the National Cancer Institute uh, to fund my research. And that was very gratifying. And, um, you know, I was very proud of that. Um, but, you know, my hypotheses didn't seem to really generate robust data. And that just happens sometimes in, in research. You got to try something to find out whether it's going to work or not. Yeah. And I wasn't, I wasn't getting robust tumor regression from the, virus, the viruses that I was trying. <clears throat> so I think, you know, the answer, I think viruses are, have a lot of potential to treat tumors. And I, and I think they're going to be part of the future of cancer therapy. But my own personal approach that I wrote a grant for and worked on for five years didn't really work. At that point, I kind of got, um, was getting a little frustrated and I decided, you know, I was kind of midlife. I'm, I'm going to try something different with my life. I've always cared a lot about politics and I'm going to, I'm going to go more into being a full-time activist. And I'm also going to, I've also always been a musician. So I'm going to go more full-time into performing and writing and, um, and teaching. So I'm a, now I'm a piano teacher and a uh, performing musician. And I uh, also um, do a lot of activism. And running for office was an outgrowth of wanting to be an activist. I realized um, pretty quickly once I started full-time, you know, delving into activism and having more time to be an activist that probably one of the most effective things I could do that I was in a position to do um, and had a decent skill set for was actually running for office. Mm. And, uh, the, the reason why I was asking you as far as I'm, 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 I'm sure that in other interviews you've been asked about COVID and uh, if, if your background has come up as far as the, in the conversation. Uh, I want, just want to ask uh, just a, a couple of questions if you don't mind. Uh, one is COVID, uh, did it start out as a parasite? As a parasite? Yeah. I mean, is the is the, is the starting point of a parasite, and uh, are, are uh, parasites and uh, viruses they have the same lifespan or, or pathway of life? Well, a paras the term parasite is going to specifically refer to a multicellular uh, organism that that you know, like worms and um, uh, you know, like um, well, maybe not always multicellular. I think like Giardia is one cell parasite, but they're cellular. They're, they're cells, they're cellular organisms. And a virus is not a cellular organism. Uh, mm. Viruses um, doesn't have a plasma membrane. It doesn't have uh, all those organelles. It's not a cell. It's, it's, it's a virus, which is just a, a piece of genetic uh, material, RNA or DNA, that's enclosed by a protein shell, um, or and it can have it can have a lipid membrane, actually. So you know there are that's called an enveloped virus, but it doesn't have um, the ability to self-replicate. So it can't reproduce itself on its own. It can only reproduce itself if it goes into a cell and hijacks the cell's machinery to produce more viruses. So COVID is a virus, it's the SARS coronavirus too. 
And um, its origins are interesting and somewhat difficult to determine, uh, but <clears throat> there's a lot of bats uh, that carry a lot of coronaviruses. And I'm not, you know, it's not clear what happened that kicked this off. It's not implausible to me that um, researchers researching coronaviruses, uh, it's known that a lot of them were going into bat caves looking to, to, to find samples of, of what's out there. So kind of exploring, like what is out there? So, so do you think that was kind of a combination uh, put together uh, that virus with um, something that would be open, uh, be able to access to uh, human cells? Uh, wait, well, if I understand your question, uh, this there's viruses that can infect more than one species. Right, yeah. Yeah, so okay. a lot of a lot of viruses that can infect more than one species, and a lot of viruses that are restricted, and can only infect one species, uh, like smallpox. The reason we were able to um, get rid of smallpox with a worldwide vaccination strategy is because it doesn't infect any animals. It can't go off and hide in, <laughs> you know, in animal herds. It can't go off and hide anywhere because it can't infect any other animal. It only infects the human animal. So if you get rid of it in humans, it's gone. And that's that's what we were able to do with smallpox, which was uh, huge. Well, uh, did you say with parasites, uh, they're unable to uh, multiply unless it gets into like uh, a, a, uh, a different cell in the, uh, in, 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 in the different host and able to multiply that way or is that a uh, virus? Well, parasites are kind of like viruses in that sense in that they... They, they do need the help of, of, of another organism uh, to, to make more of themselves. So that's a, that's a, that is a parallel. But um, the difference is that parasites are cellular and viruses um, are not cellular. Now, parasites as cells, um, they probably can do some replicating and... Uh, you know, but I mean, it depends on what parasite we're talking about. But for their nutrition, um, they ge they generally depend on um, other creatures. Of course, we kind of we do too. Like we need to eat plants and anim or and or animals to to survive. But we uh, uh, you know, but parasites are tiny and they go they go inside uh, other organisms to to get their uh, nutrition or the whatever, um, or sometimes inside human cells, like right. malaria, like the malaria parasite uh, um, goes inside of our blood cells. Right. Um, uh, and given with the, with the coronavirus uh, right now, it, it, CDC and other health organizations have said that as, the, as time goes, the viruses uh, will be less deadly, but are easier to uh, to spread, Is that, that's right, right? Yeah, that's been a kind of an optimistic pro pro projection and it may be based on what's happened in the past. Um, there are four coronaviruses that circulate all the time uh, that cause the common cold. And it's speculated that when these viruses first appeared in humans, there may have been devastating, deadly, worldwide pandemics that, uh, that happened, you know, before we really had the tools to figure out what's going on. So it's kind of a little bit of speculation, um, but, but there's a lot of evidence to, to back up that hypothesis that, um, you know, the four, the four coronaviruses that currently circulate as the, as the common cold used to be deadly mm -hmm. uh, viruses and, but as they circulated and uh, people were exposed to them, uh, you know, the people that survived that deadly pan pandemic <laughs> were left with immunity. And so that, um, and so, and, and younger people tend to not, you know, if you're, when you're born, you might have protection from your mother's antibodies. And then as you get a little older, uh, you might catch 
your first um, exposure to one of these four coronaviruses, but you're young and um, that's a protective factor. Yeah. And, well, I mean, and uh, just, uh, just looking to ask uh, if bats have, uh, have, uh, have coronavirus, uh, uh, SARS or whatever, uh, embedded in their DNA, right? Uh, bats? Yes. Well, not, not that I know of. There, there are viruses that embed themselves in your DNA, such as um, HIV. Uh, it actually, um, you know, goes to your cell, to the, to the DNA in your cell, splits it apart, and inserts its own um, genetics. I'm not, I, I'm not, sh I'm not familiar with coronaviruses doing that. Um, I could be. I could be wrong. I, I didn't make an extensive study of coronaviruses generally. You know, I was focused on parvoviruses and vesicular stomatitis virus um, in my in my research, but <clears throat> um, I'm I, I'm not familiar with them doing that. But they circulate in bats for sure, so that you know they replicate. Bat gets sick, has a cold, um, passes it on to the other bats just like the human cold, just like the common cold in humans, it just passes around the bat cave and everybody gets it sooner or later, but they don't typically die from it. And um, I, 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 as we're talking, I'm kind of thinking about this a little bit more and I'm thinking, or more uh, hypothesizing uh, that dependent on, let's say, if, th if this particular strain of, of, uh, of COVID or SARS, whichever they call it, uh, is from an older bat, which means uh, if, a, if a bat has its own immune system, if it died uh, due to that, uh, if that would be, if it would depend on age as far as the immune system. Because if the immune system is waning down because of the age of the, of the species in, in that case, that, that would mean that the SARS and SUBD already uh, embedded uh, uh, genome or whatever you call it uh, would, would have killed it, right? And um, if, if, if that was the case, uh, and if the experimentations that were going on, that we, as we're finding out that actually did happen, uh, maybe those bats were aged and about to die anyway. So the front of whatever virus that it held may have been strong at first, but weaning as the immune system get, gets stronger. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the, it's possible that the phenomenon I talked about in humans hap happened in bats too. I mean, where do these viruses come from originally? <laughs> I mean, where do viruses come from at all? It's kind of, I mean, we, we understand cellular life evolved first. You know, we started with um, maybe our RNA cells and quickly developed into DNA cells, but <clears throat> It was cellular life that came first. I mean, it had to be because viruses couldn't have existed without cellular life, can't exist without cellular life. So where did they come from? Like, what happened that we ended up with viruses? It's a very interesting question. I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, mean, bats, uh, uh, they, well, I'm, I'm, uh, to get away from that a little bit, uh, since it, I, I don't know how long I have, but this was supposed to be a 30 minute conversation, but we went up almost an hour, it looks like. Um, oh, yeah, it's, it's, oh it's, right. Uh, it, it, it is the protein, sorry to interrupt you, but is the uh, protein uh, uh, that they uh, have in the uh, vaccine, does that, is that, is that a binding uh, protein, uh, the spike protein, is that a binding protein? Yes, well, it's a it's a protein that's on the outside of the virus that the virus uses to attach to proteins on the cell surface. So it's kind of its first, you know, the virus is floating around. It's got on the outside, it's got these spike proteins, lots of them, and that's kind of like its Velcro that it uses to find a, a place to land and a, something to hold on to. You know, for a virus to get into a cell, first it has to make contact and get some kind of grip, some kind of hold. And that's what the spike protein does. And, um, and I believe it typically binds this one to the ACE2 
receptor, um, which is involved, which is often on found on the inside of blood vessels. Um, so, and, and, and blood vessels are the one. Uh, it's, it's a cell that uh, that pretty much forms the, the T cells that form the immunity uh, immune system. Uh, well, or that attack yeah. of, of invaders. Well, the the it's kind of separate. You know, the, the I think the virus is in, in infecting um, like the walls, the inside walls of blood vessels through the ACE two receptor. It's a protein that has a normal function, but the virus, like, uh, but the virus use, um, the virus uses it for its own purposes, which is just to get in the cell. Right. Um, but then the immune response comes later after the virus is in the cell. Uh, <clears throat> the cell detects that there's an invader. It sends out signals, um, and that those uh, our signals are heard by the are received by the immune system like chemicals. It sends out chemicals like interferon and nearby lymphocytes um, can uh, detect those chemicals and be alerted and that they're needed and they can be activated and they will come along. And when the cell dies, um, uh, the, the um, <clears throat> like phagocyte can come along and eat the cell and then it can take, digest what was in the cell and take some of it back to a lymph node and show all the T cells and B cells in the lymph node, hey guys, look what I ate. <laughs> and, you know, and, and um, are there any of you who would like to kill this, <laughs> basically? Uh, so the spike protein, if, if not naturally uh, uh, Given because uh, last I checked, the uh, the vaccine that had spike protein is laced with just a little bit of the. If if, if you don't get uh, the natural uh, infection, I mean, if you go in and uh, get get the jab at, at people are calling it, um, the spike protein itself. Uh, if you if you had never had it, would that bind the uh, the t uh, the the blood cell from multiplying. I mean, uh, so well the vaccine. <clears throat> Well, there's different vaccine types, but the vaccine that, for example, the J and J and the Moderna, I'm, I mean the Pfizer and the Moderna are both M mRNA vaccines. Yeah, which are uh, messenger vaccines, right? Messenger RNA. Yeah. So it it's a little strip of genetic information um, that uh, cells use mRNA to send messages from the nucleus to the ribosomes that manufacture protein. So the nucleus has all this, all these genes and DNA form. It makes copies of them, uh, little, little messengers, messenger RNA yeah. that go out into the cytoplasm and find a ribosome and the ribosome reads the message and makes a protein. So the viruses take advantage, so the vaccine takes it, I mean, viruses take advantage of it too, but the vaccine takes advantage of this system by just injecting its own message to the ribosomes, telling the ribosomes what we want them to make. So the mRNA is, goes in to a cell, re, finds a ribosome, and, and the ribosome reads it. It literally like kind of uh, goes along it, and as it goes along, it reads what's the order of the base pairs, the order of the uh, A, C, G, T, T, C, G, A, blah, blah, blah and translates it into a protein. And then in the case of the vaccine, we're, we're asking the ribosomes to make spike protein. Say, so please make this spike protein and the ribosomes make spike protein. And then the cell has got a lot of spike protein in it. Hmm. And um, you know, what happens, uh, what happens next, you know, and I'm not, you know, I haven't looked into this too much, but one way or another, uh, that's, that's got to, um, you know, most likely when the cell dies or possibly the spike protein is, is, is expressed on the surface of the cell. If the spike protein gets put out onto the surface of the cell, then there are, there are T cells who kind of surveil the body looking for foreign proteins or proteins that they don't recognize as being 
uh, part of the human, uh, part of your, which is kind of amazing, but that goes into like T cells, how they develop in the thymus and are taught what's self and what's non-self. Well, shouldn't that mean that if the spike protein that is able to get into the cell in order to uh, teach us supposed to look for this kind of uh, uh, this kind of virus, wouldn't it, that, doesn't that mean that the virus itself can multiply itself without being detected because it looks exactly like what the T cells wouldn't be fighting? Uh, wait, let me. No, the, let me the, 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 I, I, I'm saying that uh, it sounds like the spike protein can make itself look like uh, a member of the T cells, which the T cells wouldn't attack itself, right? Like um, it, 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 it clone itself, I mean? The spike, well, this, you're talking about with the vaccine or with the virus? Well, the vaccine that, that, that is supposed to stop a virus that, say, if you haven't been infected with the virus. Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure if I understand. I mean, the, the, if, the, I, I, what, what, what I'm asking you is that if you've been uh, if if you've been naturally infected by COVID, uh, could could the body be able to naturally be able to detect that it's a foreign invader and fight it as as well as it can, uh, depending on the strength of the immune system? Uh, in contrast to say, if you are uh, if, if the spike protein itself, which is not uh, naturally born into the body or from the body from the outside element, uh, with the with, with the T cell that is, that is going not to tell the uh, the cell that is going into would it not be able to identify it as a natural occurrence because it, it's being injected, and not uh, like sucked into the body. Um. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, no, trying, okay. I, I'm, I'm trying to make I'm trying well, to make sense of it, but I'm trying to also like yeah. ask some different questions about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, if you I, let me see if this if this uh, makes well, see if this answers your question or not. Um, you know, if you are infected with a virus, uh, your immune system will learn to develop an immune response against it uh, if it doesn't kill you. So, yeah, but, uh, but that's if it's naturally occurring, like like you catch it, right? Yeah. Say, you know, say you're just naturally infected with COVID, uh, with the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, your your body will, uh, will start to develop an immune response against it. No, now, no. Oh, but to, to develop a, a mature immune response takes. Um, several weeks, uh, you know, it, I mean, to develop it because there's a lot of things that have to happen. It doesn't happen right away. You know, first the body makes IgM and then it transitions into making IgG antibodies. I mean, uh, for the, for the, to clear the virus with your natural immune system, it just takes time. Uh, that's called a primary immune response. And it's just understood Primary meaning this is the first time we've ever developed an immune response against this thing. Right. And you, and you probably develop an immune response against maybe more than one part of the virus, not just the spike protein, but maybe some of the other proteins as well. I mean, you, that, 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 that is the main thing that is being, being put into people's bodies as far as the vaccine, right? It's the spike protein? The vaccine is just the spike protein. Right. Um, but the vaccine... Um, has been uh, the the reason the vac vaccines have efficacy is because um, that's enough. If you have um, immunity against the spike protein, and then the then you're exposed to the virus, uh, the the immune system recognizes it right away, and it can develop what's called a secondary immune response, which is known to be a much faster immune response. Like if you, you know, the first time you're exposed to the virus, the body takes time to figure out what to do and to respond. The second time you're exposed to the same virus or the same antigen or whatever, um, it's a much quicker response. It's called a secondary immune response. The, the, the immune system is primed, it's ready to go. It can really kick in with a strong response and much faster. And that's the whole idea of vaccination. I mean, well, yeah, but unfortunately, the vaccination has been, uh, has, has been like the last 
year, like the flu, like the flu vaccine, is from actually from the from the flu from the previous year. Which, if you not if you don't get the vaccine in the first place, you'll you'll develop that immunity before you get it, and you're probably able to fight off better. At least, at least, at least, at least that's my experience, anyway, because I haven't been vaccinated for, for for a while, as far as you know, flus and other things, and I've gotten sick maybe once a year, if that. Yeah. Well, you know, the, yeah, the, the flu, the flu virus, um, <clears throat> like COVID, is, uh, you know, for people our age or younger people, is typically not lethal. It's just kind of miserable. And, um, and if you catch it, uh, yes, you develop some immunity. That immunity may or may help you to some degree with next year's flu. The, th the weird thing about flu is, you know, it's a highly, it's a very highly mutating virus. And so it can, and sometimes it, it takes, it happens in pigs and chickens that they, it recombines and becomes this whole new flu virus. And that's when you get a flu pandemic, like, yeah. 19, like 1918. Yeah, but it, 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 it seems like right now we don't have that with the, with the coronavirus. Because it seems like in some countries and in some states, uh, in the United States, it's almost becoming endemic. Like in Florida, I heard that uh, that there's less cases, but they've also uh, they've also uh, put in like multiple uh, antibi antibiotics uh, type programs. I can't remember the actual name of it, but they put those kind of programs in in, in progress. It's costly apparently, but uh, I think it probably costs less than the actual like hospital hospital stays that it just would develop if you actually got COVID in the first place and didn't have a, a strong enough immune system to fight it off. Like something like I th I've heard that a lot of that has actually gone on with regards to natural immunity. Uh, that's why I'm asking these questions so that I can get so I can get it straight with some people that may actually watch this. Um, so do you think to a certain degree that nat that naturally uh, being affected uh, just by your environment is better than getting a, vac a vaccination? Uh, or do you think it'd be better to get, uh, go, through the co go through COVID, get better, then get vaccinated? Huh. Well, yeah, this is a, th these are questions that are kind of being hashed out, but I think what we know is that, um, you know, the COVID, COVID infection, natural infection, uh, you can't, uh, you can't assume you're going to survive it. Um, now it depends on, it depends on your age. It depends on whether you have comorbidities. It depends on, um, uh, you know, if, if you have diabetes, if you have cancer, if you have, if you're very overweight, um, uh, if you have hypertension, you know, if, if you fall into one of those high risk categories, um, it's less likely that you would survive uh, a COVID infection. Um, I mean, you, you, you might still survive. I mean, a lot, a lot of people do. Um, I follow the COVID infection numbers and the death rates, and it seems to hover around 2% pretty consistently. Um, like about a 2% death rate, you know, and everybody perceives risk differently and has different uh, tolerance for risk. Um, you know, if you're younger and healthier and you have none of these co-morbid, um, you know, uh, conditions, you know, yeah, you, your risk of death is going to be much, is going to be lower than 2%. It's going to be, you know, somewhere under 1%. And uh, you can think about whether you want to take that risk, and and if you if you don't want to get vaccinated, and if you ca contract the virus, and I do believe that sooner or later every one of us is going to get this. I mean, that sounds pessimistic, but I just I, I don't see it any means any way that this is ever going away. Well, yeah, but, but I mean, again, there, there are there are experts out there, as well as experts that have said that the longer this goes and the more variants there are, the less deadlier it, it it becomes. So, in its own right, that's I think that's the reason why I was asking earlier if it would be considered as a parasite or a virus, because the virus, like a parasite, will 
they will die out on its own. Uh, overall, I mean, as far as the severity of it. I mean. Yeah, possibly. I mean, I don't think we know that for sure. I don't think that we haven't seen that happen yet, but I have heard people hypothesize that, you know, that that is likely. Part of that may be as more and more people uh, get exposed to it. Like in the, in the time before vaccines, uh, and, and that just, was just what, that's what would happen is that vi it would kill off people who were, who were older or had, who were ill. And then the people who were left have, uh, they'd get infected and they'd survive and then they'd have immunity. So it would go on to become uh, an endemic virus like these four common cold coronaviruses that just circulate, they just give you a runny nose and, and, and you're fine. Um, but uh, now we have vaccines and people have the option of taking a vaccine and I, the way I look at it is uh, you're probably going to get this. I mean, if you live long enough, this is endemic, meaning it's not going away. Oh, yeah. And I mean, yeah, no, I, I, think, I think the conversation, excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt you again as far as the conversation. Right. But, uh, that, but, that, but I think that's the point as far as it's endemic, which means it, it has the potentiality in the next, say, year or so of actually ending as far as its severity. Uh, which would give, uh, which I would think gives more of an option to get vaccinated or not vaccinated, but at the same time, it doesn't stop the government, for instance, like the mandates. Uh, so a lot of uh, people come in from other countries. Uh, I, I, guess, I guess they're either I can't remember if it's uh, they have to get vaccinated or they or they have to prove they've been vaccinated or prove that they've uh, tested negative for for COVID. Yeah. Well, a lot, so a lot of these, this discussion comes down to the question of vaccine mandates, right? And whether, um, whether they're appropriate or not. And um, I, I really have uh, a bit, what I hope is a bit of a nuanced position on this. I, I, I know that there are p people who have been killed by the, by the vaccines, mm -hmm. um, particularly particularly the J&J &J vaccine, which is linked to clotting. And that's not conspiracy. That's acknowledged uh, fact from the, the CDC. And, you know, there's a known uh, association between the J&J &J vaccine and clotting deaths. And there's mm -hmm. a known, so same with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is also a protein I mean, an adenovirus-based vaccine. Um, so I suspect that, that that's the common denominator there is that, you know, adenovirus-based vaccines are somehow more linked, are, are somehow, it's the adenovirus component that is somehow linked. But I don't know. Um, it, it, may, it may be something else. But the, there's a lot less of it or almost none of it. Uh, there's, I think there's no clear association with the mRNA vaccines and the clotting deaths, um, there is a known risk of uh, of 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 um, uh, um, blanking on it, uh, sh attack like a shock reaction, a um, hyperallergic reaction. <laughs> um, uh, I think my I'm just. Uh, anaphylaxis, anaphylaxis, anaphylactic yeah. shock. Thank you. So okay. um, there's a known risk of that. And then there's a known risk of myocarditis and pericarditis, um, which can, which is a serious thing because, you know, you have your heart um, inflamed. And um, so these, all these, all well, these that, risks, yeah. there's, a, there's, there's well, no... Man. Sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I keep interrupting. Go ahead, please. I'm sorry. What? So please go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Well, I was just, just to say that there are known risks um, associated with these vaccines. They're, uh, they, they, there's great efforts underway and to kind of estim to estimate the size of these risks in real numbers. And people who 
Um, and to me, in an ideal situation, we have universal health care, we have Medicare for all, where everybody has easy access to a physician that they don't worry about the cost. They can go in, consult with their physician. And in this ideal world, physicians would have enough time to do this. They wouldn't be spread thin. They would have, um, they would have the time to sit down with anybody who wanted to, to talk about uh, the current understanding of risk. What's the risk of going unvaccinated? What's the risk if I get vaccinated? And, and, and the patient and the doctor together can come to kind of, uh, the doctor can help the patient come to a conclusion about what they wanna do. So I have, that's my ideal world. And I, I do have a natural uh, <clears throat> um, skepticism against mandates because, um, because it just seems, it just seems that when there, you know, where there is risk, uh, there should be choice and and my but my second state you know but my follow-up thought is well it should be an informed choice it should be a choice that a person gets to make after having a, um, an in-depth discussion about any of their concerns with with a physician uh, at no cost and we certainly don't have that <clears throat> we we have a lot of people um being uh, in a position of having to make this choice without any real chance to get it, you know, their concerns are answered, right? Right. And uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I, yeah, uh, one more question. Uh, do you think that uh, that Fauci and uh, others who uh, appear uh, who have obviously lied under uh, oath, do you think that they should uh, be held accountable for that? And for lying because it's come out that uh, that uh, the Wuhan did actually uh, uh, do gain a function that uh, they, they did and NIH did fund that even though who, Fauci uh, has said that they hadn't. Who did gain a function? Uh, the Wuhan lab uh, with funding uh, with uh, NIH. Uh, my question again, uh, do you think Fauci Collins, who is his boss, should be held accountable for that? Because Collins actually uh, has specialized in uh, jumping the genome or some sort of fact where you combine to uh, basically uh, do gain a function. He, he, uh, he uh, uh, gain a PhD in that, in that kind of work. Well, <clears throat> uh... Let me say that for me, it's a, I mean, <clears throat> we should expect the truth from our, we should expect the truth from our uh, public health, um, leading public health authorities. I, I personally am very sad to see um, the general loss of faith in our public health authorities because I, I, I wanted to be one at one point. I really, I think it's an important function. I mean, people need good guidance and it needs to be honest guidance, um, you know, but, you know, when there's a pandemic, people want to know, well, you know, hopefully they want to know, well, what, what do experienced people advise? I mean, you want, you want those people to have credibility because I, I don't, you know, I don't believe like, you know, um, like medical treatment, you need experts. That's why we have doctors, right? Like you, you don't, you don't practice medicine by popular vote. Like if you have a disease, you know, like you, we don't go to the polls and vote on what's the best treatment for uh, atherosclerosis. We don't go to the polls and vote, you know, what's, what's the best way to treat, um, lung cancer you know uh, what's the best way to treat lung cancer like you know what i mean like it's popular opinion is not the the way you arrive at the best medicine mm -hmm. uh, the best the way you arrive at the best medicine is people who dedicate their lives to figuring this out mm -hmm. and spend all day every day working to understand this stuff i have 
tremendous amount of respect for people who who do that. Uh, I wanted, you know, I considered being one of them at one point because I believe it's a valuable public service, but it has to be uncorrupt. And yes, it does have to be held accountable um, if it is dishonest, um, you know, because because if it's not, then people are only going to lose more faith in those in those institutions and in those people. And then we're reduced to kind of the blind leading the blind. Mm -hmm. um, you, you need, so I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. As yeah. To go specifically into Fauci, uh, I, I don't know all the details there. And I, I don't, well, you know, the, I know, I know, I know. Well, hold on a sec. Okay. I know I know. I was disappointed with Fauci on the mask issue because when he first came out and said masks won't protect you, they will only protect, they will only stop you from transmitting the virus. I scratched my head and I said, that doesn't make any sense. Of course, masks will protect you. I mean, there's decades of science on this. And I talked to some other MDs and we're all, and they had the same reaction. Like, what does he mean masks will protect you? Like, that's ridiculous. And um, so, and he later reversed himself, right? I mean, he and he even admitted, Jimmy Dore has talked about this. He even admitted, well, we were worried that if everyone went out and bought masks, then there wouldn't be enough left for the healthcare providers who need the most. Well, come on. You're kind of admitting that you weren't being honest. Yeah, and actually, you, you admitted twice that he wasn't being honest. Yeah. So, better, so, yeah, but so that so he's not he's not doing public health any favors by being dishonest, and and his his excuse doesn't 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 satisfy me um, because you know people could go out and use cloth masks and there'd still be plenty of N95s. And that's eventually what we settled on. And actually oh, that, that, that opened up a, uh, a industry for people with, with, with masks. Like, you know, like you go outside wear masks or if not like surgical masks. That, sorry, that, that, that opened up an industry in regards to like day-to-day uh, -day masks. Like you had like different types, different colors, different whatever. I, well, I'm saying... That's been kind of cool, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm just saying that that at least did open up a, a market for for people who were in in that in, in that kind of market too. But anyway, uh, we're we've been going for about more than an hour, so yeah, uh, well, it's I, been fun talking to you. Yeah, it's been a uh, very educational and uh, very uh, uh, you know, a lot a lot of good answers. Uh, I appreciate that. And uh, you're, the, you're the only uh, person with a medical background that can actually ask about COVID and, and all that stuff. So, and all the questions I actually had to ask. Uh, and I appreciate yeah. that. And actually, well, uh, you, you may have actually uh, uh, gotten some votes with, uh, with, with, your, uh, with your medical background as far as like Republicans or, or Libertarians for that matter in, uh, in, 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 your, in your race. So. Yeah, you know, and let me just say that, you know, the issue of vaccine mandates is um, is 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 one that's very difficult, um, you know. And but I I, I want to express that I I really sympathize with the idea that where there is risk, there should be choice. Um, and at the same time, uh, there's a there's a difficult situation with this virus, and and we hope that it's going to become less deadly, but it hasn't done that yet. And, um, you know, I don't know, there, there are some cases where I'm sympathetic to uh, hospitals, particularly, who might want their employees to be vaccinated. Um, although, I think it's also fair to ask, well, what about if they're wearing masks, is that sufficient to protect the patients? Because, I mean, they have a duty to protect all the patients that come in. You don't want to it happens all the time, actually, that you go into the hospital and you catch something. I mean, that's not just a myth, you know. I, 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 I was expecting we had to look at the, how many people have actually gotten sick from it and go by that, but it's not the art. It seems like they're, like, as a way of pushing some people out, other jobs, because a lot of hospitals actually are unionized. 
uh, this could be a way for them to push out not only the members but also possibly the union, uh, the union itself in order to open it to just you know uh, just with a, a union choice whatever the heck that, that law is where you yeah. don't have to have a union at your at your uh, at your job and a lot of these hospitals have board of directors. And a lot of those members don't don't like unions anyway because they disrupt other things they want to do in other businesses they may be a part of. Yeah, I and I, you know, there have been times in history where we had really safe vaccines that we've made. You know, all fifty states you're required for public schools to take a certain number of vaccines, but those vaccines we really have a strong safety record on. Um, you know, and and the COVID vaccine, we know there's associated risks. We know that people have died from the vaccine. We know, you know, and at a non a non negligible rate, especially if it's if you're the one it happens to. So, um, in an ideal world, um, you know, there we would have a vaccine that carried no risk, uh, and that might change my feelings about mandates if we had such a vaccine. Um, but, but we don't. So, you know, more and more, I do tend to shy away from vaccine um, mandates. And uh, because I would hate to be the person that was skeptical, was demanded to get a, a shot by my employer, and then got myocarditis, pericarditis, or worse, like the TTS, the thrombo thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome. Um, so, you know, our own state Green Party um, came out with a statement supporting vaccine mandates. And that was very controversial within the party. Yeah. And I was, you know, hesitant to kind of go along that with that. There were kind of forces within the party that were pushing for it very hard. And it's not something I, I would have rather we kind of stay out of it, actually. Um, and, and not come out with such a forceful statement. I, I ask that we put in some clauses that emphasize that people should have access to a doctor to make a informed decision and, and be able to get a medical exemption and should be able to get it quite easily. Like I, I think medical exemptions, you know, they talk about personal beliefs, allowing personal beliefs to be a qualified exemption. I would say yes, if especially after you've had a chance to consult with a physician, um, you know, and, you know, a lot of the mandates allow regular testing as an alternative to vaccines. And I think that makes, that's a good that, compromise. That, that, that makes more sense than uh, the mandate does. I mean, maybe yeah. mandate as far as any testing every two weeks or half staff, but not mandate to the shot. Yeah, yeah. The more, yeah. Or no, the or more, no, or no mandate at all. Yeah, the more I think about it, the more I, I am become becoming anti-mandate. I think there's a lot of fear of about the virus spreading and um, the death it's causing, um, and and I and the number of deaths overwhelming healthcare personnel, and the number of people that are opting out of the vaccine making this making this a problem. But you know there are non Co coercive methods, I think, like some of them are of, of addressing that problem. Uh, you know, healthcare workers are stressed out to the max, like dealing with COVID patients. Yeah. They are overwhelmed. They are burning <clears throat> out. They are quitting. They are like, this burden falls on them. The, the, the burden of disease, the burden of, uh, you know, it falls on these healthcare workers in the hospitals, and that's a consideration. Uh, you know, and but the ideal solution would be, um, you know, not, you know, not, mandates are are problematic, and the, a better solution would be if we could um, convince more people, even just to wear masks. I mean, to me, that was just a look. That was such a low barrier ask. Yeah, I, I, I can see wearing masks perhaps if you're around a large amount of people, but outside and maybe if there's maybe five people in there, there's a large enough space where you don't, we're not close enough to catch even a common cold 
I think that I think those kind of spaces and outside, you shouldn't have to be wearing a mask because you're far, far enough away from someone, you're not going to catch anything. Yeah, the risk of transmission is known to be much lower outside. Exactly. That's what I mean. And it's the same thing inside. If you have more, it's less, depending on the size of the space, you may have less than five people in there, and the, the size of the space could be determined on, trans, on the transmission. Yeah. But I, in general, I have a lot less problem with mask mandates than I do with vaccine mandates because a mask is not going to kill you. The vaccine might kill you, right? A uh, I, I, I think that the, uh, that the vaccine will definitely kill you. To, to uh, if you have all the other things you said earlier, like there's a good chance that any any anything that, that the CDC has as likelihood of you getting, the majority of that is respiratory, right? Or okay. has respiratory. Uh, what's respiratory? The majority of the of the comorbidity, the com yeah. That word, uh, the uh, respiratory uh, uh, area of the body is more likely to catch COVID because it, 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 I think COVID itself is a respiratory problem, right? The majority of people die from either uh, pneumonia or some kind of trouble breathing, right? Uh, and well, yes and no. I mean, it, it caught, you've heard of COVID toe. That's not lethal, but COVID spreads throughout the body in the blood vessels. And so, I mean... Some of the things that happen from the vaccine, like this thrombotic, thrombocytopenic thrombosis, no, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, TTS, can happen from the virus too. Um, and that may be, maybe it's the spike protein that causes that uh, by in infecting the blood vessels. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, so it, it sounds like that more things come from harm or it's the same result depending on the size and effectivity of your immune system that started it. because well, right well one thing i you know i think the bottom line for me is to say that it's not straightforward it is complicated there's risks of not being vaccinated and there's risks of being vaccinated and it's hard to weigh these and some people are and, and a lot of people are facing this decision without getting the opportunity to discuss this decision with someone who's really put a lot of, uh, who's really has a lot of expertise and understanding and like whose job it is to become an expert in this. And, and that doesn't even include me. You know, I have a medical background. I have a PhD in virology, but I'm still not, I still wouldn't consider myself an expert on, on COVID and, um, you know, I, because I, it's not my full-time job. Yeah, if, yeah. If, 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 it were, if it were my full-time job, uh, it, you know, someone who does this, needs to do this full-time, it takes a lot of effort to, <laughs> to become an expert in something, yeah. you know, and people should have access to those kind of experts to get, to pick their brain and ask and think about this consider the pros and cons, and then make an informed decision, right? Yeah, I think that's... Yeah. Which, that's is, which is the reason why I was glad I, I, I heard your background. That, uh, uh, it was what it was, because this way I can actually ask you these questions. And if you someone who's watching this or listening to this, will be on my anchor as well, hopefully, uh, they can get answers. Uh, but I think the bottom line I'm trying to get to in regards to this very long but very good uh, uh, conversation about both your uh, your uh, lecture you're running in uh, and uh, and and uh, COVID um, is if you have a if you have a, enough of a immunity in regards to just how it's built and the strength of it, you have a better chance of being able to go through uh, COVID because otherwise it seems like spike protein is supposed to help. Uh, uh, elevate the, uh, the amount of uh, immunity you have already. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, the, if you, the principle of vaccines is that, um, you know, the immune system doesn't know what's out there until it sees it. 
Yeah, it's like it's like special force. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, special force of your body. It's like if if some foreign invaders coming in, they look at it. Okay, well we we need some extra troops here, so let's call them. You know that that's that's what that is all about, right? If that's what spike protein is supposed to uh, uh, help your body uh, defeat the, or at the very least, make the uh, the pro that the process of going through the virus less lethal. It's supposed to. Yeah. I mean, the fundamental underlying principle of vaccines in general is very sound and very well established that if you expose a person to a little piece of the virus that's not lethal, then the body, body's immune system learns to recognize it. And so that when it's exposed to the real thing, it can now say, aha, I know exactly what this is. I've seen it before. I can now mount a strong, robust, immediate um, immune response, uh, unlike what happens if you don't, if you're unvaccinated and you're exposed to a virus, which is that the body is caught un, unprepared. The body's like, what is this thing? I've never seen it before. I don't know what to do. It's, it takes the body a long time to, re a lot longer to respond if it's unvaccinated, if it's un not pre-immune, you know, and like just the second time you, you're exposed to something, it's that, well, I, and that's, that's it in a nutshell. And that's why vaccines have worked so well um, to eliminate smallpox and polio and <laughs> um, all kinds of deadly diseases. You know, there used to be polio, people, kids used to walk, have to, my grandmother said she used to have to avoid certain neighborhoods when she's walking home from school, because that was like, she might catch polio there. Like there were kids who had polio on that block. So like she would go out of her way to avoid that block because she doesn't want to be paralyzed. Yeah. But um, who wants to be paralyzed? But thank God, you know, we don't have, have to uh, worry about kids getting paralyzed from polio anymore. Right. And, and oh, yeah. 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 No, I understand that part. Yeah. Uh, I think my, 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 my main thought process in the whole thing is, it would depend. On, it would be dependent on the strength of your immunity, uh, your your immunity to outside elements. And when you get it, if if your immunity, if your immune system has enough strength in it, uh, which means the whole body is not winding down as far as age wise, uh, has a better chance of, uh, of containing it and surviving it. I think is I think is my oh. my, my main point as far as that part goes. Well, yeah, but, you know, like, look at smallpox, look at polio, look at measles, uh, mumps, look at German measles, rubella. Th those are, were all viruses that had what could easily kill a person with a perfectly healthy, strong immune system. There's plenty of viruses. I mean, your immune system at its best is not going to protect you from death from everything that's out there. But yeah, yeah. but it, it, it also looks like that neither the neither neither is the uh, the vaccine. The vaccine that seems like it causes more harm than good in, in some cases. Uh, in other cases, if you have uh, if you have natural immunity, uh, it, the, since the body already has had it and has a natural memory for it, then it could and it could fight it off in the future. Now, so, so a person who is kind of like weighing the options of getting the vaccine, which has these side effects that may kill you or may have potentiality of killing you over being killed in a natural way. Well, yeah, I, I, like I said, I think that at this point, it looks clear that the virus is here to stay and maybe it'll, hopefully it will diminish in, in virulence and lethality. That would be great. Um, but, you know, I think that, um, I, I, mean, I think a lot of people, a lot of people are facing a choice between like, okay, I am probably going to get this virus sooner or later because we can't all go on wearing masks all the time for the and rest of like, our life. And getting booster shots every six months. What? And getting booster shots are mandated every six months. Well, I don't favor, you know, like I said. That, that may not be, that may not be. I personally made the decision to get vaccinated and um, my wife and two kids are all vaccinated. 
And that's because I estimated, I look at it as you're either going to get the, you're going to get the virus sooner or later, and you're either going to get it unvaccinated or you're going to get it vaccinated. Hmm. There's risk, you know, and it's, it's, it's pretty well established that if you get the virus and you're vaccinated, um, you're, you, you're better off. Your chances of dying are much, much lower. Your chances of um, getting hospitalized are much, much lower. Like that, that is solid science. That's all very well established. So I look at it as saying, um, yes, the vaccine carries risk. There's no doubt about it, but you have to balance that risk against, um, you know, the, 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 the threat of, of COVID. And I think you have to assume we're all going to get it sooner or later. Yeah, well, that, 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 that's where I'm coming from as far as uh, the way in between the two is like either way, it seems like you're going to get it like a common cold. And either, and either way, it seems like your body will, will uh, get it. And if and if things are uh, things are going the way of going, uh, the, the deadly effect, effectivity of the virus is going to down to the point where it gets to become like an extreme pneumonia. But, but again, that's all dependent on the already built up immune system mixed with the vaccine in that case. Yeah. Well, hopefully, you know, the virulence will go down. And um, I would love to see that happen. And that would make all of this <laughs> uh, much easier. But we should probably leave it at that. I, and it's been a long and <laughs> wonderful, wonderful discussion. Yeah, I've, I've actually enjoyed it myself. Uh, and yes, it's been a long one, but... Uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll see how, how much of this interview will go up on YouTube since YouTube has been censoring uh, content that does feature COVID and other things like that. I, I've had, yeah, I, I've had uh, three of my videos taken down for violation. Of course, during those same times, I was talking about ivermectin and other things like that too as being potential for uh, for early treatment, not late not late treatment. And ivermectin, the, not the horse to warmer. But the already proven, yeah. already approved uh, pill that you get from your doctor. Well, so. let me just say on that, you know, I think that um, that should be a decision between a patient and their doctor. You know, and I think the science is is confusing. I've tried to look into it and tried to find definitive evidence, and there, you know, it's. There's some studies that show a benefit, some studies that don't. And you really, it's hard to like, what are you going to do? Like read all, there's like 200 studies out there. And I you know, have to like, I, I, I have literally read uh, probably half that, if not a little bit more, because I've, yeah. done, I, I've done constant uh, coverage of it. And and I have uh, done shows about that. And I, uh, I forget the actual... Uh, the full name of this place, uh, this organization, but the FLCCC, uh, they do uh, clinical trials of ivermectin and other uh, uh, possible treatments for COVID. Yeah. Uh, I've been trying to get the guy that, that, that does that share something uh, on this show, but anyway, uh, the point being is the fact that I've, I've done quite a bit of research on it myself and yeah. where, where they have actually been a part of the treatment and it's worked apparently. Yeah, I mean, I think there's enough, there's enough evidence that if it were me and I had COVID and, you know, I, and there's a, there is a low risk from the, from ivermectin. Uh, it is commonly used and to treat river blindness. And, you know, it, there's enough, there's enough suggestion, even if it's not like clear and definitive, um, there's enough suggestion that it may be useful that when you're facing a patient who's got COVID, they're in a very serious situation and there are, you know, they're at risk of death. Uh, and you, you know, if you want to take a risk, a small, there's almost, there's very little risk really from taking the normal dose of ivermectin. And if you want to, so, you know, what's the harm, you know, if the person wants to, uh, to try that, it's not zero, risk of anything bad happening, but it's pretty small. And uh, so again, it's a, it's a case where I think the doctors should have latitude to decide what they want to do with their patients. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've heard of like doctors prescribing ivermectin and then the pharmacy refusing to fill it. 
Yeah, okay. because yeah, because uh, well, it, it seems so, uh, and, and it just seems to be true actually. Uh, coming up with Mark, uh, that since Mark actually owns the end for uh, Mecton, uh, it's expired. They can't they they can't make any extra money on that. So they decided to come up. They're 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 trying out a new uh, pill form of ivermectin, but a, a different thing. Uh, Hydrochloroquine, hydro I think the name of it is, uh, or another another type. But it's a pill that is that they could repatent it and resell on, yeah. on the market. Oh yeah, drug companies do that all the time when they have some drug, and the the, the patent is running out on it. They'll like add, they'll add like a hy hydrogen to it, or they'll just like, or they'll yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Put they'll, it in they'll, they'll tweak the formula a little bit just so they can patent it. Yeah. yeah, they'll just tweak it a little bit so that they can pat, so they can give it a new name, and patent it again, and and then um, yeah, they do, they play that game all the time. Yeah, and I think because of the popularity of our of Maxim again, that's when Mark decided to turn around because they underpended on on that. And they are deciding to add that with something else, like uh, yeah, something else, and and is now going through FDA FDA trials. So you'll have to so you have the vaccines, the booster shots, and then you'll you'll basically you'll have like three different things for one thing, three different methods. Excuse me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, th there's no doubt that money has a um, a corrosive influence on. Um, you know, medicine, there's all the, all the medical reps that come to the doctor's office and are pushing the new drugs on, on prescribing physicians and trying to sell them. And uh, if, 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 have you ever, have you gone into CMS in a while? Uh, it's the, uh, it's, it's the, it's the website that Medicare uses to, to, uh, to find out more information about, about uh, pricing of, uh, generic medication. Uh, no, CMS. Yeah, I think it's CMS. Uh, on there, they say the prices of shots, whether it be coronavirus or measles or whatever else, they say how much the uh, state will reimburse any given health facility when they administer it. With uh, a regular shot, like a, like a flu, is like 28 bucks per shot. With coronavirus, it's like 38 to 40 bucks per shot. And so, the, so they're creating a demand I, t I think I told you originally that I'm I'm a monetary theory uh, adv uh, adv advocate or however you want to say it. But yeah, I, I, I'm interested in that. Yeah. Uh, well, their basis, is, as far as I as far as I can see, is creating a demand for something, product or a way of paying something, depending on the uh, on the demand for it, right? So I was looking at the demand that they're they're creating with the with the different Hello? brands. Oh, Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, uh, my my point being is, it seems like they're trying to make a de trying to make a, a demand for something that may not have needed a demand. So a demand for shots, demand for new medication, stuff of that nature. Uh, as soon as uh, the blood clots thing were was uh, was reported, that same maker decided to come out with a new blood clot thinner. So it, it, it's a kind of accessory kind of marketing they're doing right now. Regards to that, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll I'll let you go. <laughs> yeah, it gets, <laughs> it gets complicated. You know, like there are there are medicines that are in our in our capitalist system. Like, if you want medicines, you, you pay for them. You know, and like some of these medicines are good medicines. Um, but it gets complicated because of, uh, you know, the political influence of these manufacturers that shouldn't have any political influence. And so, uh, I mean, that just gets back to why, you know, we need a party like the Green Party that doesn't take any PAC money, that doesn't take any corporate PAC money, any PAC money of any kind, one that's completely uncorruptible because we only take individual um contributions and and our position is we want public campaign finance so there's absolutely no donors uh to worry about at all it's all just tax you know publicly funded uh democracy you know 
it would just go so far to restoring people's confidence in the system and to getting better outcomes. I don't get paid for this at all in regards to what I'm about to do, but I, I think I, I said, uh, I talked about the depths of myths, right? By Stephanie Kelton. And the, the first time we talked. The deficit myth. Yes. Myth. Oh yeah. That's an MMT book. Uh, it's a, uh, it, it, it's basically Stephanie Kelton explain what MMT is. Uh, how the government works around that and stuff like that. It's basically what the economy is. And I would suggest you get this if you, if you want to learn more about MMT. Okay. Yeah. The, the, as I said, I don't get paid for this as far as I've heard of that, which is it. But, uh, but it, it's, it's, it's been critically, uh, critically acclaimed by people that have learned more about MMT. Yeah. So uh, I, I've, I've been trying to get the Green Party as a whole to learn more about MMT. So that yeah. it would fit more into the platform and get away from the how you got to pay for it scheme. Get away from what? How you got to pay for it scheme. That 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 portion of the conversation that always stumps everybody who doesn't know anything about uh, functional economics. How you get paid for what? When you come up with a spending something spending. Uh, for, oh right. Yeah yeah right. yeah. yeah. MM, MMT helps you take that out uh, of the equation as an argument or, or talking point. And gets to more of what is what the money that you want to do or want to spend, and where it goes and how it affects other people's lives. That's yeah. a, that's the core to me of MMT. But anyway, we've been going we're, we've been going out for more than an hour, so uh, <laughs> we should probably, uh, before uh, Zoom kicks kicks us off, uh, we should probably end it. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to edit this down probably already as it is. So. Well, I'm going to I'm going to try to put up uh, not as it is, but I'm going to add a few things. But uh, yeah, we'll see how we'll see how long it takes, and if YouTube will accept it. Right. Well, I appreciate your work. Thank you very much. I I, pre I appreciate you running, and uh, thank you for uh, for the time, and also thank you for the COVID talk. All right. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.